Welcome, everyone. It's great that you're here. My name is Andrew Crosby. I'm a fellow at the Asian Trade Center, and you are attending the State of World Trade. Um, we have a, a great international panel to uh, talk with us today and uh, talk about the kind of trade system that we're facing and how it's evolving. Um, so for those of you who don't know the Asian Trade Center, we're based in Singapore. We've been involved in the uh, TPP and the RCEP. It's home also to the Asia Business Trade Association and the Asia Pacific MISMI Trade Coalition. And we do something called the Talking Trade Blog, if anybody wants to connect. And uh, joining me, uh, we have a fantastic panel. I have uh, Yana Freraga, who's Deputy Director uh, General at the WTO. Luca Vicentini, uh, General Secretary of the European Trade Union Confederation. Uh, based in Belgium, Lisa McCauley, CEO of the Global Trade Professionals Alliance, uh, and Ruben Atepe, who is uh, Executive Chairman of Mekawa, the Merchant Company of West Africa. Uh, so, for this panel, we're going to do uh, we're going to do some interventions from each of the panelists, and then we'll roll out with an interactive discussion. Um, the uh, you are welcome to put some chats or comments in and i'll try and reflect those once we get into discussion uh, we'll try and keep track and do that so the the question that we've been asked to address is the the following the pandemic represents an unprecedented disruption to world trade and are we going to experience an acceleration towards protectionist trade policies or will it create new opportunities uh, and how can trade and economic inclusion across countries and trade blocks become a key post-COVID recovery uh, uh, factor. So I, I would also add, uh, everyone else is aware that there are a lot of other things moving in the world. And so there are geopolitical dynamics to what extent has the COVID helped to trigger or to uh, impede those dynamics? Uh, what, to what extent has the nature of trade itself changed? Uh, digitization or trade facilitation and supply chains or increased concerns or ability to address labor and environmental issues. Uh, and will trade become more global or regional in the coming years? And I think our panelists are incredibly well placed to give us a, a tour of these. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to ask Ambassador Aga to uh, take the floor. And uh, Ambassador Aga, as somebody who served in trade negotiations as a, di as a diplomat for, for your country, Nigeria, now as DDG of the WTO, uh, where you've taken on the first African and first female director general, uh, how, things, uh, how have things changed? What should we expect? Any changes? Uh, thank you, Andrew. You, you raised a very uh, interesting question. Uh, but I think uh, it must be looked at from the perspective of the opportunities and challenges that the multilateral trading system and the WTO have been facing, uh, is facing and perhaps may continue to face. Uh, based on my little experience over the past uh, 30 years, uh, I would want to say there are two things. The system has been successful. Unfortunately, nobody talks about the success stories that we have had, like the new agreement in Bali, the export competition success from Nairobi, the tariff rate quota administration framework, and some of the incremental issues for the LDCs, duty-free, quota-free, uh, services, uh, uh, preferential access for trading services. These may not look big, but they are successes. On the other hand, we tend to uh, dramatize the failures. So I think this is a narrative that we'll have to cope with. For me, I'm optimistic. And I think that uh, for the membership, uh, first and foremost, there is a recognition that the fundamentals of the multilateral trading system, the principles on which it, has, it was built, 
they remain strong and they have continued to serve the members. So even if you don't have a WTO today, just like uh, the former U.S. Uh, trade representative said in, uh, in Buenos Aires, even if you don't have a WTO today, the world will have to reinvent one. So the system has to be there. The second thing is the WTO has helped the members address the kinds of challenges they have had. Let's just imagine if we didn't have the rules-based system, we didn't have the framework, and we would have had a situation of lawlessness. But because the rules are there, members check themselves in terms of what they do, and members, in spite of the challenges, have never embarked too much on this beggar thy neighbor policies. And uh, the trade monitoring reports by the WTO show us that we have had more of trade liberalizing measures than trade protectionist uh, measures. I think the system has also shown that when there's the biggest challenge, people come together. So I'm hoping that the pandemic will be an opportunity for people to come together, just like the 9-11 provided an opportunity for people to come together to deliver uh, the Doha round in 2001. And we are also lucky that, as you said, we now have a new leadership in the WTO, and we also have a new leadership in the U.S., which is willing to engage. So I hope that coming together, uh, putting ahead the need for international cooperation would help uh, the world rebuild the WTO that will continue to deliver for the membership. well-being of workers in Europe, a big, important organization. What's, what's your take on what we're facing and what we're coming up to in respect to the issues that you follow in respect to labor and workers? Thank you, Andrew. Well, uh, you know, we are not in an easy situation, of course, uh, when it comes to global trade. Uh, we had already a sort of trade war that was... Uh, uh, essentially started by the Trump administration some time ago. And then on top of that, uh, we had COVID with all the disruption in the supply chains in particular that this brought uh, uh, to, the, to the picture. So uh, we, we are facing to some extent some kind of blockage. And, uh, and now also with uh, what's going on with the vaccines uh, and uh, the need also to try to uh, uh, introduce possibly some derogations on the TRIPS agreements, I mean, resolving the problem of patents uh, to allow all the countries in the world to produce uh, uh, a number of vaccines uh, that can really cope with the emergency, etc. All these challenges, of course, the global trade rules uh, and how we are able to govern this phenomena in a, in a broader perspective. But at the same time, I think there are also uh, incredible opportunities that uh, are opening up. Uh, first of all, because we had the change in the uh, US administration with a completely different approach, and also uh, because there was a change also in the leadership of uh, the WTO. Uh, we have great expectations, I have to say, on both these uh, new leaderships, uh, because we think uh, from a trade union perspective, uh, this is my perspective, but I would say more in general, the perspective and the expectation from the global trade union movement, uh, that uh, this can really change the game and can really improve the rules and address this blockage. You know, the great uh, uh, challenge is if we are able or not uh, to move from a, a purely, uh, let's say, uh, liberal model of on trade uh, 
uh, that was the paradigm, I will say, of the past uh, towards a more sustainable concept of trade, where economic cooperation, fair economic cooperation first, but also uh, uh, attention for environmental challenges. And uh, last but not least, from my point of view, of course, uh, making sure that also human rights and social rights are fully respected in the trade, envir trade environment. All this, of course, is the real challenge in this uh, respect. Uh, having a change in the US and WTO uh, should mean also that we can really deliver finally uh, this reform that is needed for the functioning, a better functioning of the WTO. But there are also important developments taking place, somewhere already mentioned. Uh, but uh, there is one that I want to mention because for us as the trade unions is really crucial and is uh, the achievements that have been done uh, in the US MCA agreement recently. Uh, the agreement between the US, Mexico and Canada. Uh, uh, these achievements, paradoxically, if you want, uh, were done during the Trump administration, but this process came from far away in the time uh, because it was launched by the Obama administration. And there, for the first time ever, there is there are real uh, systems and instruments for enforcement of labor and social rights uh, in a trade agreement. It's really a revolution in this respect. Uh, and we really expect that uh, next uh, trade agreements and next trade negotiations and also cooperation agreements, we really take this uh, highly into account together, of course, with a full respect for uh, the environment and uh, a full implementation of the Paris Agreement uh, targets and now also the Green Deal that the European Union has launched. And last but not least, uh, I would like to mention that in the past we have been as trade unions very critical on the lack of ambition from the European Union because the European Union never moved from a neoliberal approach towards towards a more sustainable and cooperative approach when it comes to trade. But now probably also from the European side, the narrative is going to change uh, in the new communications on global trade and on the reform of the WTO, the European Commission has just published. There is a different approach. So. I would say great challenges, but at the same time, also I hopes. Lovely, and I, I, I like how we're all we're already stepping into the dynamics here of, of the conversation of the kinds of changes that uh, we're looking at. So there's there's progress. WTO is there, and it's uh, and it's got some new life. Uh, you're describing some dynamics in the system uh, where where they could be unifying or they could be dividing, right? I think that's an interesting one to come back to. Uh, let's let's go to uh, Lisa McCauley. Ms. McCauley, uh, Global Trade Professionals Alliance seeks to cultivate international standards within the industry and create a trade environment that is both inclusive and trusted by all. So what's what's your take? Uh, how do you, yeah, how do you, how do you see the picture evolving COVID or uh, COVID plus? <laughs> or COVID plus. Um, I mean, I think we're in an interesting environment, as my colleague was saying, in terms of we've got new leadership at the WTO and what does that really mean? Because at the same time that we have this reinvigorated sort of agenda at the WTO, we're, we're sort of in, in now this sort of awful argument about IP and the TRIPS agreement and vaccine. And it, it seems like that's become a little bit messy to be honest with you and um, I am kind of interested to see how this is going to play out because um, you know there are countries that sort of like um, would say that they are for for the WTO and for free trade and then yet they're digging down on this argument um, and so I'm finding that really interesting and it's becoming very domestic from a policy perspective and therefore where are domestic policies now influencing things at a global level um so i'm kind of interested in in that because um you know we, it's great that, that that we have a new administration in in terms of biden but at the same time there uh it's not like they're sort of kind of like they're, they're sort of digging down on a by american policy um so what does that mean 
And what does that mean from a procurement perspective? And what does that mean from a policy perspective? Um, I think we just need to sort of play it all out. I think we're kind of relieved, but at the same time, we're relieved, but we don't really know what that means, if that makes sense. We're just trying to figure it out. Um, And right now, I, you know, digging down on a Buy American policy is just as protectionist as uh, the previous administration so what does it mean is my question and i'd be really interested if the other panel members could actually even answer that question as well in terms of what they think because um i think a lot of people are trying to understand uh, a lot of this at the moment um in that s- stuff is being said that sounds nice but uh at the same time it's also actually maybe kind of like, yeah, not so great on the outside when you look at it. When you look at them digging down on the TRIPS agreement and then Buy American. And, and so what does this all mean? Because, yeah, so I'm interested for my panel members to answer that question. What do they think it means? Good, I like it. Yes, that it's right. It's that we got some sense of pulling together, but also same old, same old. Right? There things are things are diverging. Uh, so I bet I bet uh, Mr. Atekpe has some insights on that as well. Uh, Are you able to hear me okay? I got a little, little lag in the video there. Ruben, can you hear me? Uh, I think we got a frozen video. Give one more second. Okay, let's let's see if we can come back to him. Uh, I think he's got a frozen a frozen video. So w- w- maybe we could pick up on that question. And I'm I'm curious. because you mentioned the USMCA and some progress there. And, uh, you know, is, is, is that going to be the, our people, our, our country is going to come together and then, uh, and then go a different direction. And then I, I think there's a similar question also for DD Tiaga. Uh, sorry, let me just go back. Ruben, can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you. I hope you can hear me now. Okay, we can hear you. So, so if, uh, excuse me. So, I, we were diverting a little bit in your absence, but let's come back if you're able to address the question of the panel. You have the floor. I I missed the question. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, the questions. No, the questions. Basically, um, you know, what is what's been the uh, impact and likely impact on global trade of the dynamics of of COVID. Uh, and in some of the conversation earlier, I think, you know, we were getting into a little bit about some of the things being the same and some things changing. Uh, and I think particularly from your, your perspective uh, in Ghana uh, and your private sector perspective, uh, certainly picking up on some of the things you and I talked about earlier, uh, you know, what, what, is the, what does this evolving global trade system look like from your point of view? Okay, so very quickly, I mean, definitely things are moving more digital and more localized. So the emphasis is on doing business in Ghana and across Africa. We're seeing a lot of that. We're seeing a lot of people ordering stuff on Amazon and doing Zoom calls and things. And so that's where it's going to benefit the U.S. because... There's a perception that they are better at 
or best at digitization across the board mm -hmm. from a local and inter the, the first international business that there is all relates around healthcare. So PPEs, vaccines, general healthcare, most businesses that are even sort of semi-industrial have been uh, remodeled to or retooled to produce uh, sanitizers and the like. So now that we started the vaccination process, I see that there's still going to be a lot on self-reliance that A, how do we feed ourselves in case this goes back? How do we protect our health, get medical supplies and things? For that, definitely we need the rest of the world. Then for some people, there's reliability of vaccines and things that they have there they have a natural inclination inclination towards europe and america before the rest of the world so there's a lot in flux but definitely the thing that i can say is we're not going to come back to near normal for many years to come good thank you so let's let's pick up on if if we can uh th this question that lisa posed because i think you each would have a, a differing perspective on that so if if i may let, let's just go to luca and you mentioned the usmca uh and and then we'll go to ddg aga and then i'd like to come back to you ruben and, and we we ask that same question about the afcfta and then we'll go back to lisa how's that that's fine. So please go ahead, Luca. Okay. Well, uh, uh, first of all, um, a few considerations about the UMCA agreement. Uh, I said before that it's a bit of a revolution because for the first time we have uh, an agreement that encompasses a very ambitious uh, sustainability chapter when it comes to labor uh, and social rights uh, and uh, envisages concrete instruments for enforcement. Uh, uh, it is not only sanctions, it's first of all monitoring and inspections uh, and even uh, cross-border monitoring and inspections uh, where uh, social partners, trade unions and businesses uh, are involved directly. So it's not only uh, the different states with their own labor inspectors that are intervening in the matter, each one in its own territory, but on the contrary, cross inspections uh, where uh, trade unions and business organizations are directly involved. This is even more important than sanctions, you know, because it, it allows uh, to prevent uh, the need for sanctions uh, by addressing the problems in terms of labor standards violations before they arise and before they become uh, uh, so serious uh, that need uh, sanctions. Nevertheless, there is the second part of the agreement that allows for sanctions. And by the way, the sanctions are gradually increasing with the seriousness uh, of uh, the violations uh, until coming to uh, preventing, let's say, the companies that are involved from entering the different markets in terms of export and import. So this element is really crucial. And there is a third element that I would like to underline, and is the fact that uh, these instruments uh, have already started influencing uh, the evolution of the labor market and uh, labor rights reforms in the different countries, particularly in Mexico, by pushing the public authorities and the government uh, mm. to reform their industrial relations systems and their labor protection systems to make it more, let's say, equal and uh, on fair competition basis uh, in comparison to the US and, and Canada. Uh, so uh, uh, coming to your second uh, element, uh, is this a sign that we can have the same in other agreements? Uh, it will be great, we hope so, uh, uh, but uh, I think it will be a long process because we have seen, for instance, uh, the nasty uh, decision of the European Union uh, uh, before, just before the end of l last year, 2020, to sign this investment agreement uh, with China, where, on the contrary, human rights and labor rights are not considered at all. There is only a slight reference to the need uh, to respect the ILO Convention on uh, uh, Forced Labor and Child Labor, but nothing else. Mm. So I think we have a bit of a diverging picture in this respect, and we really need to 
to to fight and to have a battle, a struggle. I mean, to to make sure that the good example of the UMMCA becomes a standard and a benchmark also for other situations. I would say, right. Ide- ideally, a race to the top. What do you what do you think, uh, Fred? Is that? Uh, I mean, I I don't ask you to comment on that, but I mean, the, the WTO has played a role uh, in brokering a number of things short of new multilateral agreements. Is there some facilitative role for WTO in all these dynamics? I think uh, a lot will depend on the behavior of members because I think this is part of the challenge that we have. Uh, The WTO is not a UN Security Council that can say, you do this. The WTO largely is member-driven based on the existing agreements. And each member would want to stick to its rights and obligations as much as possible. So how they behave would be, would depend. And I think if when you look back, it is a changing character of the global economic landscape. Take, for example, in the past, the success we had was driven largely by the private sector. So it wasn't just government negotiators going to negotiate. It was demand-driven by the private mm-hmm. sector, who are the beneficiaries of the outcomes of the negotiations. So you could easily see whether the outcome met the objectives that the private sector wanted to have. Mm. Second, a lot of the negotiations we had in the past in the past were driven by the EU expansion. So each time the EU got more members, the US would demand a round of negotiations to make sure the balance in the agreements were maintained. It's not the same thing now. We now have new players, more members uh, around the table. And so the success stories of some of the members in the trade arena has created a new challenge. So we're not just talking about how the benefits from trade are shared between countries, but also how they are shared within countries. And some of the challenges we have now is because of the inequalities that have resulted from reforms within countries. So it's not whether China has become such a success story and should pay more, but it's how China's success is perceived vis-a-vis some of the individual segments of society in different member states. So I think what we need to configure out is look at trade not as a zero-sum game, but a win-win situation. So if developing countries prosper, they serve as better markets for the more advanced technologies of the developed countries. And the developed countries would also serve as markets for the lower end basic manufacturing products who make livelihoods out of the supply chain also benefit. But if you don't look at it that way, then you, you, you end up with a crisis where, where populism becomes uh, the, the rule of the day and the sentiments that are driven are anti-trade, anti-globalization, anti-development, and overall, everybody loses. Yeah, yeah. That, I think this is a great lead in to, to uh, Ruben. And maybe you have a comment about that in the AFCFTA, Ruben. And then I really want to get back to Lisa. Lisa, I'm sorry, you've been you've been patient. We're going to come back to you right after Ruben. No, I, I can't agree more with with my. Community, where Nigeria is the dominant economy and they also should be the dominant economy for AFTCA and they are a reluctant participant in this because they've been so used to 
having their way and, and, and dominating, it, it's what I can say is on the issues that we find they support, it's very easy to move along on the things that they do not support, then you'll get a little foot dragging. But everybody is really, really thinking about how do we reach each other practically? And if I add to that, that not so much this year, but last year in West Africa, there was a renewed threat of Ebola. So suddenly all the protocols of trade become non-existent. Everybody wants to close their borders to even the next country, land and sea borders be very stiff. So it's, it's really figuring out how we can work and connect as remotely as possible where money flows and, and the like are concerned. And then where there are physical flows, r really we, we have to observe what, what the new constraints are. Good. Yeah, thank you. So let's come back to Lisa. So that you got you got a bunch of different views there, Lisa. You want to comment on them? And and we got about uh, we just have about uh, nine minutes left, folks. So I'm sorry, it's a fast panel. But uh, so if if you can intervene, and then I would just like to get a couple last words, brief last words from everyone, if we can. So the floor is to you, Lisa. It's okay. I'm not going to take nine minutes. I'll take like one. <laughs> so it's all it's all take okay. Your time. Take um, your time. I, I, I think the, the interesting thing that the panelists have ha highlighted is the immense opportunities that do exist. But the one thing that I will still probably harp on about is the need to really address the trade facilitation barriers. And the more we can break down those barriers and standardize those barriers to make it easier to trade, be it if you're a female entrepreneur or, you know, a, an indigenous entrepreneur or, or whatever, the, the more we can sort of start to break this down and think about it in terms of a different approach in terms of how we look at trade facilitation and data, I think the better, because that's just going to foster and grow um, the trade opportunities that everybody has talked about. And I do think they are there. Um, and the interesting thing is, I just think um, the rise in the opportunity for Africa as a continent to be a leading economic powerhouse, I do think is there. And I'm really quite excited about the opportunities that that is going to present. Um, I, I think it's really exciting. Um, um, but... At the same time, learn from other countries in terms of their mistakes and take on new opportunities to, to, to not do the same mistakes. But it, it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity. Yeah. Okay, so everything's in play. So let's, I, I think we, we've got a lot, yeah, we've got a lot of moving pieces, right? So let's, let, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I think so. I mean, I, 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 I really think that if I could be honest in terms of like the outcome of the last couple of years, we've dealt with um, a health crisis, a climate crisis, numerous crises that have all transcended all at once. And so what does that present? It presents an opportunity to rechange. It, it presents an opportunity to rechange everything and, and relearn. Good. So I'd, I'd like to interject one thing here and then let me come back for some, uh, you know, we've got about seven minutes to Didi Giaga next, but you know, my, I think what I'm hearing is uh, countries are being practical. They're still being practical. They're still acting on their interests and there are some new possibilities, even if the old behavior exists. Um, the piece I'm going to interject is that we have a moving background of uh, urgency in respect to climate change and we have dramatically changing economies, uh, in particularly in respect to digitization. Uh, so we have gains in jobs and losses in jobs. Uh, so I, I know we're at the end of the panel, but uh, I'd just like to pass the, pass the mic over to Didi Tiaga, 
uh, see if you have any reflections on what you've heard. And uh, then we'll go back to Ruben, uh, back to Luca, and that should finish us up in the next six minutes. So Didi Giaga, it's up to you. Well, uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, uh, my take uh, is the same, I think very conceptual, because trade policy works for each country based on its specific circumstances. There is no silver bullet. Your resource endowment, your population size, your geographical location, everything must be specific to you. So if you are in an island state, you have ocean resources, so a blue economy approach could be good for you. But at the end of it all, there is the need for the country to identify where its growth centers should be. So you could say, well, I have nothing to do, but I must be producing chips. Africa needs to produce its own telephones, its own computers. So I will go for the components. Or I would want to produce components for the aviation industry. Once you make that decision, then you can begin to build your competitiveness around it. It has to be specific to you. It's not, if you don't do it that way, you will, get, you will not get it right. So once you do it that way, you look at the market, you look at the industry, you look at the standards, you look at the supply chain or how you move into the market. So I would want to suggest that uh, Africa countries need to have that approach. Otherwise, the CFTA will remain only an opportunity, just like Agoa was an opportunity that we never used. Just like the Cotonou preferences are opportunities that we have never used. Or the GSB schemes of Canada, uh, Australia, Japan, that we have never used. So if you, if you take all these as market opportunities, then you look at what the products are, then you look at what the quality is, you look at what the market size is, then you can begin to do your reform in your country to take advantage of this based on your resource endowment, the kind of skills you will need to have, the, more, the investments that you will need to attract. And sometimes the behind-the-border reforms that you need to get the investments in, intellectual property rights protection and things like that. Key points. Thank you. Thank you. Ruben, just a couple minutes we got uh, left. Do you want to uh, say any last words? And then we'll pass to Luca for the last word. Yeah, definitely being in Ghana, which is the home address of the AFTCA, we, we're forced to think more about its benefits. So we really have been looking at how we present ourselves as the financial and commercial point of contact, the Brussels of Africa now is what they're saying. So all those we already, our port and air links are quite strong in the context of the continent and there's a focus on that more. I'm very optimistic about the future in spite of everything because the companies that have survived the COVID have just had to rethink what is their focus. Mm -hmm. the, the government has had more revenues come in because here the informal sector uses mobile money. Mobile money is is more rampant. It's it's even for those of us in the formal sector had to use a lot more of that in during COVID. So there's a huge interlink of informal integration of informal and formal through tele telecoms, especially around the whole money space. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that, I think, is, is going to be exciting. And, and laws and things are being passed around. For example, Thank just you. a few days ago, the government announced that all of us, our national ID card numbers are going to be used as our tax identification numbers to facilitate revenue collection. That's also 
all very interesting. Then, may, may, may I, I'm sorry, Ruben. May, I think we're gonna we're just gonna get cut off. So may, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but may, may I please pass to Luca for just a sorry. final yeah, yeah. word? Yeah, I apologize. I think we're just gonna we're running up against the end here. Okay. So, please, sorry. Thank you, Luca. Please. I don't know if we're gonna get cut off, but if you have. Yeah. Just just a word about the two challenges that you mentioned, climate change on the one side and digitalization on the other side. We have two ways to address these challenges. Coming back to business as usual uh, after COVID, and this means that we will have winners and losers, or go for the win-win solution that uh, DDG uh, Aga was referring to. That means uh, sustainability, just transition, keeping everybody involved, the cooperation. I mean, this is really the alternative and we have to make a choice. And I think that uh, the choice is very clear as to be for sustainability and win-win solution. Yeah, yeah. thank you so much. Uh, thank you. you. You all did beautifully and I'm sorry I had to rush you through the panel. Uh, we're at the end of our time. I really appreciate it. Excellent, excellent uh, comments. I think be practical. A lot of creativity left in the system, and there's room to go up. There's room to go up. Yeah. So thanks so much, and I appreciate it. And uh, I'll.